Um, I first came to Cambridge, and uh, Robert probably doesn't know this, in uh, 1978 to visit uh, here uh, uh, one of our MIT professors who was um, on sabbatical here, uh, Professor uh, Robert Whitman. And I understood immediately why he and his wife loved to come here. It's a wonderful setting and a great academic uh, place that uh, I feel very honored to be able to come to, uh, to participate in the uh, annual uh, advisory group meeting, uh, and, but also especially honored to be asked to give uh, this presentation tonight. Um, I uh, hope you find it useful. It might be a little bit different than what's usually given in this hall. Uh, I'm more of a practical applications person, and so I decided that I would focus on some of the lessons learned the hard way from some of our projects, and what is kind of an overall message that I feel I've learned in my some 45 years of uh, working with instrumentation in um, mostly heavy civil uh, applications. Um, so the roadmap for what I'll do in uh, this hour or so um, is why do we monitor performance of infrastructure? And again, I focus a lot on, uh, mostly on construction. Many of my, my examples will be that, but, but I'll give you a couple of others uh, as well I'll get through some illustrative applications to uh, show you what, we've, what I feel we've learned. I'll talk about the components of an effective i and program. We talk a lot about doing it, uh, what makes it work? and what are some of the things that are really uh, important to a successful program. I want to talk a bit too about the importance of monitoring in real time um, and why that now is something we should give a lot more attention to that we, than we might have done in the past. And then I'll wrap up with a few summary comments. Uh, the kind of work many of us do, um, we almost take for granted sometimes, but it's, it can have very serious consequences when things go wrong. Many of you may recognize the uh, left side of this is a big collapse of, uh, of a deep uh, shaft in Singapore being constructed as part of a uh, metro system. Uh, it was all modern engineered. It had a lot of instrumentation in it. Um, it uh, was going along fine and then suddenly without warning collapsed um, and caused a lot of uh, issue both from a disruption standpoint but to careers of people. Uh, those are things that don't happen often, but when they do happen, uh, the consequences not only to the project, but to the community and even to the, the government and the worldwide profession can be pretty significant. The lower right is a similar kind of thing that happened in the United States to us on uh, Dulles Airport. This was a Natum tunneling project um, that was progressing forward, and one night they had a run-in, and unfortunately one person was killed, two were trapped and a $3 billion investment program was stopped in its tracks for about three years, um, trying to sort out the best and safest way to go forward. So those lead to you know, tragic collapses, but is that the only thing that we, we worry about when we instrument and monitor? Is, uh, is it really limited to helping us avoid failure? Are there other things that we can do, especially in today's world where we design and build things, hopefully with better tools that keep us fr uh, away from failure? Uh, we have very sophisticated methods uh, that, uh, when done right, can do these very tricky projects. We don't have many failures as a result. So is there a role for I and M beyond uh, helping us avoid the, uh, failures? Um, and furthermore, does, I and M, uh, does having an I and M program guarantee we will not have problems? Both of those projects I showed you had instruments on them that were being monitored. Um, so, in, and also the big question uh, that uh, some of us are facing is, what is the true value proposition for i and Why should we do it? If we're, if we're, is there something beyond just um, avoiding failure? Um, and that's what I want to focus on uh, in a, a lot of the point of this uh, presentation. Here are, over the years, I've tried to compile the many different engineering reasons why we might do an instrumentation and monitoring program. The first one being, of course, indicate impending failure. In the early days of geotechnical engineering, under Terzaghi and Peck, uh, this was one of the mo probably the most common reason for, for doing it, as they developed some of the early approaches. But we've gone along now to have a lot of other reasons, all the way to the bottom. I won't go through all these. Uh, I'll point out a couple of things, like we use it today to help protect us from damaging adjacent structures. That's one of the increasing, in the United States, one of the increasing reasons that we do millions of dollars on some of our large infrastructure pro projects. 
We don't want to damage structures because we don't want to face the litigation that comes when that happens. All of them were increasingly we may do i &M just to simply show on a daily basis that the facility is performing well. That's an important message. We don't have to always bear bad news. We can bring good news. It's very valuable for a project manager to start out every morning with something on his or her screen saying, green, keep going. You don't have to worry about performance today, or at least not uh, at this moment. So if you look down through my list here, though, you'll find that there's a common element in many of these. Uh, and almost all of them, I, in fact, could say there's a way I could state this to have that common element. And that is that they all help us to identify and manage risk in some way. If you really, really look at the root, you know, failure is about risk. Uh, damaging adjacent structures is about risk. And risk is something that not only we, but our clients really understand. Our contractors really understand the word risk. They understand, they talk every day about how do we manage risk. And I want to suggest to you that that conversation, that benefit or that, that value or reason for doing instrumentation and monitoring is a far more powerful reason than simply saying, oh, we're, in, we're geotechnical engineers, we're not exactly sure what we're doing, or how this structure is going to perform, so we'd like to put some instruments in. Right? That, that argument doesn't go over too well with many owners, particularly after you've given them an invoice for $50,000 uh, to design something, and then you have to say, well, I'm not really sure. I'd like to put some instruments on. But if you start talking about risk, and you start talking about uncertainty, and the fact that everything we do involves uncertainty, which implies risk, then we can start having an open discussion about the role and usefulness of instrumentation and monitoring. And that's some of what I'm going to try to demonstrate to you in this, this talk. So really using monitoring performance to help us lower, and I'll call it operational risk. I'm not talking about bid risk or uh, so much. I'm talking about when we're actually doing things, how do we identify emerging risk and uh, do things, get, get a notice that allows us to do things to manage uh, and control that risk. Risk, as many of you know here, is a combination of kind of the probability of failure times the consequences, or there's some other definitions I see showing up now, the likelihood of some und undesirable event times the impact. Both of those are still really the same kind of thing, just different words. Uh, and what you can find is, if you've been around doing this like me and others, uh, good monitoring can help us lower the probability of failure, and it can also help us reduce the consequences. So being able to affect both parts, of both components of that equation is pretty powerful. And we do that, of course, by using monitoring to give us early warning that an uncertain event is starting to show up so we can intervene, so we can mitigate that risk. And so one of the key things that any of you who work a bit in tunneling and tu the so-called risk registers that are put together to, uh, to, to help you identify risk and manage those risks, uh, you talk about, here's my risk, here's my mitigation measure, and then how can I monitor, what can I monitor to tell me whether that risk is emerging or not? And so you see this fits into the concept of tunneling risk management very well. When we talk about consequences, one of the things I urge people to be careful about is make sure you consider all possible consequences. Because in today's well-connected world, some of these consequences are becoming much more important. We used to worry mostly about loss of life. We design many things today so we don't lose lives uh, anywhere near the rate that we used to. When I was a young engineer, the typical number was one life loss per mile of tunnel. That's totally unacceptable today. But there are other, we got that well under hand with modern safety programs. But there are other risks, like if something goes wrong, we lo lose the facility or the use of it, we damage other property. But one of the biggest risks on projects today is delays. Delays are very costly. And so if we can do something that tells, gives us indications of things that might cause delay so we can mitigate that, then it's effective risk management. Cost of litigation, especially in the United States, can be a big uh, issue, and damage to one's reputation increasingly can be a big issue because we're all on the web, right? So when we look at management and risk management, um, 
One of the uh, things, you can look at this uh, breakdown of the steps of doing risk management. You identify, you assess what the magnitude of the risk is, you plan how you're gonna manage that, and then you use a concept that is used in a lot of management. If you're gonna manage something, you gotta do what? You gotta set up a metric and then you gotta monitor it so that you have some feedback. So a key part of any risk management plan should be a monitoring plan. Is that risk emerging? Is that particular event emerging? And as soon as it does, what is my plan to step in and change the course? So control, that's changing the course. And then reassessing, you know, risk constantly changes. So we've got a reassessment going on. So I call this process of instrumenting, monitoring, and responding to the risk. So we gotta, you can't just put instruments in, that doesn't save you anything. You gotta collect the data, you gotta do something with the data, and then you gotta respond when necessary. That, those pieces have to go together. Another key thing, I think, of talking about instrumentation monitoring from a perspective of, of, of risk management is it gives us a tool to talk with people in a language they understand better than our geotechnical speak, right? So how many here are geotechnical background people? I'm just curious. But all those many of you are structures, I suspect. How many are structures? So you know the concept of factor of safety, more or less, right? It's, it's, it's like the resistance divided by the driving force. It's, it's how much safety I have kind of built into the thing to avoid collapse. And so in geotechnical engineering, we'll talk about a factor of safety on, say, a slope stability or a face collapse or, a, or a, an excavation instability of 1.3. What does that mean to an owner? What does that mean to a contractor? Doesn't really mean a whole lot. I've had some contractors say, oh, you're 30% over-designed, right? Why, why isn't 1.01 good enough? Um, I've had some engineers say, oh, gee, you're gonna go with a 1.3? I usually do 1.5. Well, that, that's a tough discussion to have in ways, but if I can change that over to talk about a probability of a massive failure of one in 30, which is one, way, one equivalent of the same statement, uh, there's not a unique equivalence, by the way, but, but in some circumstances, one in 30, that really gets people's attention. If I tell you your bridge has a chance of one in 30 of falling down sometime in its lifetime, I really got your attention. If I can tell you then that I can implement a good instrumentation monitoring response program, and that's gonna increase our factor of safety to 1.5, you still might not know much unless you're a specialist in geotechnical engineering about what that means, but if I tell you I can reduce the failure probability to more like one in 300 or one in 1,000, you can sleep a lot better at night. So risk gives us a communications tool to talk across disciplines and to compare relative safety across disciplines. So I find that's a very useful tool and one of the re things that's driven me over the last 10 years or so to really use risk management, risk identification, risk management as a key reason why we do instrumentation and monitoring. So I say here, an effective instrumentation monitoring response program can, as a conclusion, can help us manage and reduce risk by 10 to 100 times. That's pretty darn effective. Um, I have a paper on this if you, in uh, the U.S. Society of Dams if you want to pursue where I got those numbers. They're based on some actual experience. Um, and so if, if I can come up with a, a way where I can instrument something, I can measure something, and I can respond without all that costing me a lot of money, it can be very cost effective. One of the, you notice I've got the word effective underlined here. I'll come back to what I mean. Why did I underline that and why is it so important? One of the important things in our, in our facilities, our structures, is to recognize that conditions change in time and almost all assets deteriorate with time. So there's some of the things that we work with is we need to continue the instrumentation monitoring through construction and perhaps through the service life as well because of this tendency of things to get worse with time. So if this, I'm selling a good story here, it sounds like. Uh, there's a, a lot of opportunity to do instrumentation and monitoring. Why isn't it done more often? And if you look in the history, these are reasons I've had people give to me as to why they nixed an instrumentation monitoring program or cut it out of the budget or whatever. Cost is always an issue. Benefits hard to quantify. That's what I've been talking about so far. Uh, reliability problems. Things went in, they didn't work. Uh, giving to a bad experience or inexperience of people that are 
uh, driven by price and uh, are poorly execute programs so they don't really deliver uh, the value they should. So a message out of this is to avoid these things from happening, we need to design and execute our instrumentation monitoring programs so we can avoid these problems so they work to help us reduce risk. Um, and doing what we do must provide dem demonstrable value to our clients. So we've done a poor job in the past of that, I think. We, we, we talked uh, technical speak, but we haven't been able to communicate very well to politicians and to some of our owners why we should be doing this. So I want to move from that uh, to you know, kind of close that door on, on how risk and risk management is a, is a real reason we do these to some examples and lessons learned from some of the things we've done. Uh, this is a bridge in uh, New England that uh, is existing here, being replaced with a brand new bridge. And the concern was in driving the foundation piles for this new bridge, we could impact potentially this bridge which had to stay in service. And these piles were driven and founded into something called the famous Rhode Island silt. Those of you who are geotechnical engineers, ah, oh, silt, you're going to be driving piles, you're going to be causing vibrations, mm, that's not good. And look how close these two bridges are together. So the design engineer put in a very rigorous instrumentation monitoring program on that old bridge to monitor it while this new construction was going in place. So this, uh, this diagram shows the old bridge. We've got a lot of instruments on it. There are several hundred on this thing to monitor strains in the key structural members, but more importantly, displacements. We used GPS systems. We used uh, robotic total stations with GPS on top of them so we knew exact positions of things. And one day, everybody was sitting around uh, having a late lunch, and all of a sudden, the alarms went off, which we do today. Of course, many of you know alarms go through the system and come out on your, on your device. And uh, so I hope you can see there that uh, th this diagram is showing movements in uh, up and down direction, this bottom one. All of us, it's very, very flat, looks very, very good, nothing's happening, and all of a sudden this thing takes off and moves within a matter of a half hour about uh, a half an inch. Now for a bridge, moving down a half an inch in a half hour is pretty serious consequence, right? So everybody's thing goes off, the question is what's going on? Contractor comes out of his room and says, what? Your instrumentation isn't working, it's busted, it's giving a wrong signal, we always hear that, right? So they get in a truck, run out, and find, sure enough, the contractor's foreman has decided, decided to drive a pile very close to the, this pier that moved. It wasn't on any drawings, it wasn't on any shop drawings, it wasn't approved. It was a template, a, a pile to hold his template in to drive his big six-foot diameter piles. Didn't tell anybody. He's driving away, it moves. That was a wonderful event. That saved this project because it made live, real, the fact that we were in a very precarious situation driving these big piles. We needed to follow the engineer's instructions. So this is a case where real-time instrumentation monitoring saved the day for this bridge. They were required to jack it back. You'll see here we're able to tell them and give them feedback as to how to put the bridge back in its original position. So one, one lesson. Another lesson, this is a bridge in Washington, state of Washington, that's been moving slowly. It sits on a fairly shallow hillside, but the soils are really terrible. And this bridge is scheduled to be replaced. This is a famous floating bridge uh, in, in, up near Seattle. And so they wanted to know how much it was moving. But you, it was, everything was moving, so it was very difficult to sort all that out. And particularly how much was one segment of the bridge moving relative to another segment. So this is a poor picture, but it's the only one I could find where we have a, a receiver, an antenna for GPS signals like your phone has here from satellite positioning, and it will tell us how that, um, that antenna is moving in XYZ position to about one millimeter accuracy. Really, really tremendous. Now you say, well, gee, mine, mine's only good to what, five meters? But it's using a different technology of the same signal. It's called differential GPS, which can be much more precise. And so here's the locations on that bridge. And I just show this as an example of, this is showing um, transverse movement, longitudinal movement on that bridge, and then up and down movement. And the scale here is each one of these divisions is one inch of movement or two and a half centimeters. But the real important reason I put this graph up here is the time scale here is five years. 
Now, any of you who've been around in the instrumentation monitoring business over many years know that you never see data this clean and this, this much data. There's only one glitch in that data over a period of five years, one. And we never doctored this in any way. And these are data points for every day of the year for five years. That's tremendous improvement in the technology capability. And it doesn't cost us much more for reading this once we've got the system in and going. This is one of the revolutions that's come in instrumentation and monitoring, is some of the things can be highly reliable and uh, not very costly for add once we've got the stuff in. Now, it turned out this bridge wasn't moving as much as they thought, and uh, that was great news to them as they designed a new replacement bridge. So, you know, the fact that it wasn't moving was good information. It wasn't moving as much as they thought. So let me go to another case. Uh, this is the Big Dig, famous Big Dig in Boston, um, which uh, has been maligned in the press in many ways, but from an engineering construction standpoint, was an absolute uh, uh, miracle in some ways, but many great things done. The problem, of course, was here's an existing elevated highway carrying you know, saturated with traffic much of the day. We need to replace this, but we can't take it out of service. So we dug a tunnel underneath this while we kept it in service. And people like Professor O'Rourke here in the audience uh, worked with us and many others to make this a, a, a great success. Here's another piece of it where it has to go between these two towers. And there's a deep excavation here of some uh, 110 feet that really touches the edges of each of these towers. Um, and so a lot of risk here, you can imagine. Here's another picture where in this crowded mess here, here's the head house for our uh, tr train service to New York. Underneath the street here is a subway station uh, that's one of the main lines in Boston. And right here in this part, we dug down this deep, 110 feet. There's people so you can see a sense of scale. Um, this, this is just by many ways a very demanding undertaking, much like what you've been doing now in Crossrail in London, uh, although yours is much larger than our big dig, I think. Um, the challenge here is that there were 150 historic structures within the uh, impact zone here. All of them had a lawyer waiting for us to screw up. And uh, Boston is notorious for, uh, for lawyers uh, along with New York. And so, uh, so part of the risk, that our risk there really was claims from adjacent uh, building owners, property owners. And so how do we control that? And the engineers put their heads together and said, one of the key risk mitigation factors here is to limit the movements of this excavation system. We want stiff supports. We want movements to within less than a couple of centimeters. And if the contractor gets over that, we're going to shut them down. So we have to have a very proactive monitoring measurement system to do that. And uh, that was done. It was very effective. A key part of it also was with these buildings very close to the construction, we knew we'd have a lot of complaints about vibrations. And sure enough, you know, we, we hadn't even started work and we're getting complaints about vibrations. Um, and yet, when we went into a proactive, very proactive vibration measuring system uh, that was collecting data in real time, uh, we found if you plot these that most of the vibrations were well below uh, anything that would cause damage to buildings as shown by this line uh, up here. This is frequency along this graph. Key thing here is don't worry too much about the numbers. The, the, the point is we weren't causing anything that was likely to damage buildings, but we were getting a lot of complaints. Here's a place where instrumentation monitoring helped us message back to people, yes, we understand, we're sorry we're disrupting you, but your building is in perfectly good shape. We're not gonna harm it. So another application of uh, instrumentation monitoring to manage risk of dealing with the community and keeping that under control. Just for the fun of it, I went back with some of the project leaders on this uh, project later and did a, almost a post-mortem on what could have gone wrong had we not have instrumented and monitored this project. So this went through, it's a little bit of a hind casting, a little bit, uh, almost uh, uh, a little bit theoretical, I suppose, but I had the input from the project people. And so we tried to estimate what are the things that could have gone wrong, what would the consequence be, what was the likelihood or probability of each of these things going wrong, multiply those together, you get a risk, add them up. There was a potential exposure on this job of $550 million by this calculation. Now, that's a starting point. 
we actually spent about nine million to fix things, cracks and, and damage. The monitoring program cost us about $60 million all in. Uh, that's instruments, reading, evaluating, everything. So we potentially, with instrumentation and monitoring, saved a half a billion dollars on this project and avoided risk costs. That's a pretty impressive outcome. And I think one of the great successes, a story that doesn't get told, is the uh, benefit of the instrumentation monitoring program on the big dig. Let me move right along here. Another couple of examples. Doesn't all have to be buildings and tunneling. We have one of our clients is Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a, a big coal burner. And they, uh, one of the pro things of burning coal is you produce a lot of coal ash residuals. And so we've been working on evaluating some of their major uh, stacks. This happens to be one that's almost 100 feet high in profile. I hope you can see what I'm trying to show here. Uh, the original design engineer did stability calculations assuming that this was their phreatic surface or the top flow line and their stability analyses assumed that pore pressures on that, that sliding surface all were heads associated with that top flow line. They got a factor of safety uh, down around 1.2 for this cross section. We went in with some of the um, concept of grouted in place piezometers. Uh, Professor Vaughn uh, many, many years ago at Imperial, uh, 1962, I think, first came up with this idea that you put a, a sensor in the ground and you grout it and it would still work perfectly well. We measured these pressure heads, so I've got a sensor there and it's measuring water pressure up to here. Not up to here, as was originally assumed. That's a huge difference in water pressure, pore pressure, acting along that slip surface. And if you take these measured heads into account, the factor of safety of this jumps from 1.2, which was unacceptable, to 1.5, which was acceptable. That's a huge benefit to this particular owner. And they have 30 stacks around three states in which this, uh, and some, many of them, this same kind of benefit could be achieved by uh, good measurements uh, from an instrumentation program. So this is one that's not in construction, this is in service, and we're using instrumentation and monitoring to help us assess a uh, factor of safety, which in turn uh, indicates how much risk we uh, are facing. So, <clears throat> let me skip this one in the interest of, oh no, I gotta tell this story. <laughs> this, uh, I get into trouble, some of these I think have good lessons. This is a, uh, a deep excavation about 100 feet deep next to Corps of Engineers uh, Dam. You don't mess with the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, this was an excavation for a hydro plant, one of the few we've built in the United States in many years, it's low head on the Ohio River. And when we were uh, exploring for this, this is, a, this is a 3D diagram of what the excavation would be for us to be able to construct that plant. And we found evidences of a fault running through the site. It, the core had actually found it running underneath their structure here. And we thought it was going to be exposed here running along these lines and we're going to have to deal with it. So the design it consisted of adding to the original design, which was not there, this was design build, adding these massive rock anchors. These things are, when they're put together, there's the hole we dug there, drilled there, was 15 inches in diameter to hold something like 48 tendons uh, going back into the rock to hold, pin this thing back. So one of the, this is one of the first applications where we use some new technology of a uh, sensor that goes right on the tendon and gives us an indication of how much load is in that tendon. And so you look at this diagram here and this is a measurement of uh, load over time as we start doing excavations. Uh, and this is one away from where that uh, um, uh, fault zone was located. And you'll see we, we pre-stressed these tendons to a design load, which is this blue line here, and then we measured over time. And this time scale here is um, uh, three, one, about five months, five or six months. So that's very, that's very good data coming back and tell me. One of the things we always want to know in anchors, rock anchors like this, if they take their load, then we're safe. If they lose their load, then we lose stability. So this is some of the best data I'd seen on rock anchor loads in a while. But here's one located near where that fault zone was. When we actually dug in here, the fault zone was, was clearly there. We had some slaking off of some of the rock, but we had all this stuff pinned back in a way that it's interesting. One of the anchors did show loss of load there, 
So we got down below the red zone and we had a lot of debate about what do we do. And we decided it was better to leave it alone and see if it looks like it was leveling out, which it did do. But having this information was tremendous value in letting us convince the Corps that we could go ahead and continue with the work and finish the job, which we did. We also had some backup instrumentation where we were really, really looking at the movements of the rock back behind that exposed face and it was small. It was well within what we expected, less than a half an inch or so. So that was great. Here's a, an example in New York City where we've been building a lot of subway projects recently and one's called the Second Avenue subway. That's out in the middle of the street. We've got stations we've got to do. And we have a lot of buildings that are four to six stories built in the late 1800s, masonry, very sensitive. We thought they would be very sensitive to, structure, to uh, differential movements. The original limits set on us were on the order of one centimeter maximum settlement. But next to this, I'm going to go down 110 feet with a strutted excavation. And I can't, the building really, literally, right next door to this, can't, uh, isn't allowed to settle more than half an inch. When I first saw that, I was working for the contractor. I said, there's no way we're going to achieve that. It's just not possible. And by the way, the building had already settled almost 12 inches in its life because it's sitting on soft clay. And it had leaned outward about 8 inches. We're still doing perfectly fine. So why do we have these tight limits? We started with the work. Uh, one of the things you don't want to happen is have a, something like this show up in the news. Um, this wasn't our building, this wasn't our project. It had happened uh, just a few months before where people had actually been moved out of one of those six-story buildings in the middle of the night. Sixteen families had to be moved out because it had settled and cracked. So we have all these sensors on these buildings to give us uh, warning, uh, enough warning that we can try to guide and control uh, these things. And so here's a case uh, where we put total stations, as shown in the, in the diagram here. Each one of those is a surveying station mounted out and automatically works like a robot, essentially measuring a lot of sensors, a lot of prisms to tell us how these different buildings are moving. And you see from this diagram here, see this crack? That's pretty serious, isn't it? You know, that's uh, about an inch wide, if I remember right. We have a number of these in these buildings. Um, we allowed that to happen because we didn't have much choice. We had to get this thing built, and what we were doing was monitoring the building, recognizing that we're going to have to fix it, but it wasn't structurally impacted. We had experts in the building uh, frequently uh, making sure that this wasn't uh, going to be damaged. We promised the owner to fix it, that they have something done at the end that was better than when we started, and that worked very well. Remember I told you we started with a limit of an inch and a half? Here's where we ended up. This is 4.2 inches settlement of one of those buildings. By carefully managing the process, using a very careful instrumentation monitoring and visual inspection program, we were able to coach this project uh, in, to a successful completion. Um, so here's um, another example that goes a little bit differently. And this is New Orleans uh, during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, one, two failures that were very significant uh, uh, along the International Harbor, Harbor Navigational Canal. I, I hope you can make out here. This was a levee that broke, and it's flooding the Lower Ninth Ward. And the other location, again, a levee that broke, and it's flooding the Lower Ninth Ward. So what happened is basically water got over the top of these things, overwhelmed the system, and these are the sh what was originally sheeting with uh, concrete... Uh, uh, segments added to raise the height, and you see now it's laying horizontal. It's totally overwhelmed by the floods. Uh, same, same here. Um, so we got the idea of, um, gee, the next time this happens, we, or before it happens, we'd love to have more feedback on the state of health of this system that protects New Orleans. And we came up with a concept that we called I-Levy, intelligent levy or uh, instrumented levy, whatever. Um, and part of that was to put in some things like fiber optics that we could just simply throw into a trench very, very quickly, cheaply, and do distributed fiber optic readings to try to just give us an indicator, is strain occurring anywhere along this flood wall? And this, this represents the flood wall protecting people on this side. So that was one type of measurement that we would take. We could also measure temperature and say, are we getting temperature changes that we might attribute to water starting to flow over the top of the, of the system? 
Here's another attempt that we were making to put a fiber optic down the top of this flood wall. So you see the guy's cutting a slot here, and we're going to lay that fiber down in it. And if the flood wall, which is in 30-foot segments, if a segment starts moving, we'll get strain at the joints, at the construction joints, and it'll give us a flag of something starting to yield, starting to fail. You, you can see what we're looking for here is something that gives us a lot of measurements for low cost over a very long lengths because the entire flood protection system for New Orleans is 360 miles. How do you do that? You can't do it with point sensors. And so this was one concept we tried amongst many, including INSAR satellite uh, stuff. But this was a great idea. We went looking, this, we did it as a prototype, proved that it would work, went looking for money to roll it out into a protection around, close around New Orleans, got nowhere. To this day, we can't really go very far except for very limited instrumentation on one of the big flood walls. It never got, it was a great idea. We proved it would work. It never got anywhere because there was no champion in the state with the power to make this happen. And that's my second big major point, the first being risk management, the second to do really good instrumentation monitoring programs. You gotta have a powerful champion patient. By power, I mean they've gotta have the ability to make stuff happen. Without that champion, great ideas will never survive. And so, just to illustrate that a little bit further, it just happens that two of these examples come from the same state in the U.S., Louisiana. This again was after uh, Katrina damaged this bridge over Lake Pontchartrain. We built a new bridge that's shown here under construction, and they decided they wanted to have the first full-scale instrumented bridge in the United States. And we fortunately were chosen to do that. By full scale, we have strain gauges and inclinometers in the piles underneath the foundations for some of these piers. We have strain gauges in the piers and these columns. And then over the main span, we have strain gauges in the structural members, the key structural members, and we have way in motion machines to tell us what, uh, what trucks are going over. So we know what went over it, what it weighs, and how that force is distributed down through the entire structural system into the soil. And that's all done with some specialized data loggers. All the stuff comes in. These read data at 60 times a second and process all that information. So it, its potential is to be able to tell us if we get hit with a wave, we know how big the wave was, we know what pressure goes on it, and we know how the system responds to it. If we get a heavy truck going over it, which they have a lot of that problem in, in that part of the country, we know it and we know what its impact on the structure is. So we can combine all that together to talk about future lifetime expectancy. That's the idea. It hasn't worked. Why hasn't it worked? We got it all in, we got it all tested, we collected data from it using temporary generators. The contractor doing this work, the electrical contractor uh, went uh, bust finishing it, never wired the bridge for power. The state had no ability, no money to deliver power to this bridge for two years. When they finally delivered power, they didn't have the fiber optic cable that was to carry all the data from this room back to the processing center. Here we sit four years later, all this stuff in and no data. Again, the problem here, no champion who had the power to make it happen and maybe no compelling reason to really move this forward, which is really tragic. This is one of the things we have to be very careful about. We can put money in as we did here, a fair amount of money, but if we don't have somebody who's gonna stand behind that and keep pushing it forward, it'll die. I'm very sad to tell that story because this is something we were, uh, we were very proud of and wanted it to be a great success and put a lot into it, but it's, it, you know, there's only so much we can do. Um, so let me turn from that to uh, a couple more key things um, that, I th that affect this, uh, this whole business of instrumentation and monitoring. And these are developments that have happened uh, over the last 10 years that I think many of you who are here at the uh, center know about this, but a lot of folks in practice, probably it's happening and you don't realize what its impact is. And that is that our ability to collect and manage data has become very powerful. You know, one of the drawbacks we used to is, well, it takes too much, to collect the, too much money, too much time to collect the data and process it and graph it and do anything with it. We can get you all the data you want. Uh, the electronics for sensors and data loggers uh, have become much cheaper, much more reliable, much easier to use, 
and in some ways almost fully automated. So that, that's a great revolution in technology that impacts this, this instrumentation monitoring field. The ability to do things wirelessly makes it much cheaper. We don't send people in the field to take measurements anymore. That used to be a big cost. We get all the data we want for essentially no cost because transmitting data by wireless network has essentially no cost to it. The other side of that low cost communications is we can send results out to people for no cost and we can do it instantly. When I first started in this business, you, you, know, it took you, you, you went out and you took some measurements, you took it two or three weeks to make the report and then you put it in the mail and somebody got it a week later. You know, that just doesn't work. We want instant feedback today. If an instrument goes into that red zone, we want 20 people on the project to know about it within a minute or two. And we want them to know what to do when they get that message um, and, and be able to respond. So all these four or five things are really changed this whole field of, of real time, making instrumentation monitoring a real time possibility. Not possibility, practicality. We do it on many of our projects without thinking so, twice. The thing that hasn't changed a whole lot is the cost of putting instruments in and maintaining them over time. This still is a big challenge for us and the folks here at the center, I'm pressing on a little bit, you know, what can we do uh, in these arenas and some, uh, you know, this is still, you still got to hire a driller to put stuff in the ground, you know, and it's still kind of expensive. We've got to figure out better ways of doing that part and we've got we to figure out ways of cutting down on the maintenance because we have jobs now, projects where owners are are actually thinking about things for the very long term. And so we don't know how long some of our stuff might last in those. So let's turn a little bit to the question of monitoring in real time. Uh, you know, when I, going back to uh, my early years at MIT, uh, we were doing a fair amount of work on dams and we felt we were lucky if we got to a dam once every three months. And many dam owners at that time went to the dam once a year. You know, but if you look at a lot of the failures we have, they happen pretty darn fast, right? Overnight, or certainly maybe with a few days. Monitoring once a quarter, once a year, just doesn't do it, you know? And so with the developments I showed you earlier, being lower cost to do a lot of this stuff, it really makes real-time monitoring uh, very feasible from a financial and technical standpoint. Um, if we can get this early warning, if we are headed for a failure, we can generally take preventative actions and head it off and avoid the failure or reduce the consequences. And with real-time monitoring, we're also much better able to connect cause and effect because you see, you see data that's really true data and information telling you how things are trending over time. And so that's, that's far uh, really valuable. And I'll, I'll give you an example to demonstrate that. Um, this is uh, LA Metro in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, we're fortunate enough to be working on two major projects there now as the Metro is expanding its uh, underground uh, transit systems. Um, this is the MLK station on the Crenshaw line which will take people from uh, one of the existing lines up near the center of Los Angeles down to the Los Angeles airport. So it's a very important line. And here in the center, uh, we're gonna cut all this out and make a deep station about 70 feet deep and these are buildings next to that that are three or four stories uh, tall, not in very good shape, on shallow foundations, and are owned by people who have a fair amount of uh, public uh, power uh, uh, influence. Um, and so uh, here's the TBM going in there. And uh, one of the things about TBMs, uh, once you get them up and going, they go pretty fast. You know, this thing started eating through the ground at about 85 feet per day. And so we're trying to put sensors in the street and tell us, are we getting settlement as the TBM goes by? You can't take a reading a day and have it be very valuable when something is moving that fast. And so just some, uh, what, it, what we were asked to do here now is to put some settlement points over the crown of this tunnel so that as the tunnel, as the, as the TBM approaches digging out this hole here, we can see, is the ground settling too much? Is the street about to collapse? You may see, if some of you may have seen pictures going back almost 20 years ago in Los Angeles where a bus collapsed into a hole created by this, this type of mining process. It, was a, it wasn't a TBM, it was a, a digger shield. But, but um, 
the whole population of Los Angeles lives somewhat scared today of a repeat of this, now that we're back digging holes in the ground. And particularly the city of Beverly Hills, where we're proposing to dig underneath their high school. So we can't afford to have a failure here. You talk about risk. We can't afford to have a uh, collapse, a daylight. So we have these sensors put in the ground, some three to five feet above the crown of the tunnel to tell us, is this moving? And uh, give us an advance warning. If it moves too much, the TBM operator is actually seeing these data in his machine and he shuts down. Well, we're going along and one day, the limit here is uh, an inch and a half. We go past the yellow zone of about uh, nine tenths of an inch. If I, and see how fast it drops down here? You know, that's literally in a matter of about uh, 10 minutes. This is an amazing process, folks. We're collecting data off of that sensor wirelessly. It goes back to our private cloud service. I was in an airplane, 40,000 feet, checking this instrument off my laptop. Isn't that amazing? And I noticed it had done this. We didn't have an alert out. I texted my uh, superintendent, said, what the hell are you doing? And three minutes later, he said, oh, we forgot to turn on the alert. It's on now. Uh, they had forgot to set it up right. It's on now and the alarms just went out. <laughs> Fortunately, we caught this. But the interesting part of that story is it didn't quite uh, get to the one and a half inch. We didn't shut down, but we were very interested in what had happened there because this line is showing on the horizontal distance as we advance with this TBM, it's showing how much settlement. And look at the yellow dots here, and this is one inch. And we'd had one occasion here where we had gotten down right at the startup, almost an inch of movement. They fixed up a couple of things that went on. They were doing really well. We got less than a half an inch of movement. And then one day, this is the one I was showing you in the last graph. It got almost an inch and a half. And we were all nervous. We were up. It was in the middle of the night, trying to sort this all out. It cleared itself up pretty quickly. Guess what? They went looking and found that the tail... Um, the, uh, the uh, grout in the tail uh, device had stopped functioning. It didn't have enough material in it. The material feed wasn't working, actually. So the whole idea here of grouting behind the, uh, the tail had, had stopped, uh, or wasn't working. Uh, they fixed that, and here's the rest of the job. This is a great use of real-time monitoring. One, it told the contractor right away he had a problem. To it told them to go look for the problem. They found it. They fixed it. And then it held them to the, to the ground. They held their feet to the fire, really, to make sure that they operated this thing properly for the rest of the job. So instrumentation and monitoring sometimes is a very useful feedback tool for us to keep people honest about what they're doing. So uh, I think this is one of the most uh, best lessons that we've had in the last year or two um, about uh, some of the value of what we're doing. And particularly in Los Angeles, where we have this potential of getting stopped from going into Beverly Hills, having that kind of confidence uh, developed in, in these early stages is very good. But here's another story, though, that I think is very interesting. This is for one of the stations. In fact, the photo, I, I think this is for the photo I showed you, Martin Luther King Station. And here's settlement points outside of the excavation um, with time as we dig that excavation down deep. Now, settlement is plotted here so it goes down on this axis. And so this red line is a half an inch, uh, which is our limit. Uh, what are these data showing us? It's going up. We're digging a hole, and the ground outside is heaving. Does that make sense? Well, it really it didn't make sense to the designer because he had predicted an inch of settlement with modern tools. This had the latest finite element analysis done by very, very uh, sophisticated people. Isn't that? So what happened here? What, what was the phone call that I got? Your instruments aren't working. <laughs> okay. So we double surveyed. We checked all our benchmarks. We had some uh, third party uh, surveyor check it. No, this site heaved. Very interesting. It's a very stiff excavation support system. Groundwater is down at the very bottom of this hole, which is almost 70 feet deep. And we took 70 feet of, we unloaded the, the dirt. We unloaded the, the ground. It heaved. There's no doubt in my mind it heaved. This is wonderful. This is one of the things about instrumentation monitoring that keeps us honest. 
as engineers. And that's, that's a very powerful tool. We've actually had three stations exhibit this behavior so far. Uh, for those of you who are structural engineers, I threw this in. We do a little work on bridges. This happens to be the Tappan Zee Bridge, in, the new Tappan Zee Bridge in New York across the, the uh, Hudson River. And the designer of this talked the owner into a full-blown structural health monitoring system. And um, so we're in the process now of uh, putting that in place. Uh, this is, our guys were down recently, it shows you the progress on the bridge. The span in one direction is done. Traffic will go on to this in August of this year. All of our sensors are in. This also has full cable TV and um, uh, load measuring sensors. It's got corrosion sensors in the deck to tell us about salt penetration. It's kind of the state of the art in structural health monitoring today. Um, here's some of the control rooms being wired uh, inside the control house on the bridge that will then feed all this data back by network to a central uh, control place for the state. So I asked the structural engineer who designed this, why are you doing all this? Getting back to this question of what's the motivation, what's the benefit of doing all of it. And I'm not going to read all these, but I think you can just kind of see out of his report uh, what in this case we're doing to instrument something that we design by code. It should, we, we measure with a lot of quality control. We have a lot of, we just have a lot of control and influence on how this thing gets done. And yet there's still things that can happen to it that present risk. And again, this is, this is a person designing it, and if you read most of these, a lot of this has something to do with risk management and asset management. And so uh, um, I think uh, the key challenge here I threw out, though, is we collect data on about 800, we will be collecting data on about 800 sensors at a rate of about 60 samples per second. And so if you do a calculation, that's uh, about 100 gigabytes of data. Um, uh, each day. That's a lot. And we've developed some processes where we bring that down to about a gigabyte of data a day, which is a hundredfold reduction. I don't have time to go into all that, but this is where the challenge for some of the folks in the center and us are working on. How do you deal with so much data and get it down to just what you need to do? The one gigabyte sounds pretty good, but this bridge is supposed to last for a hundred years. How are, you know, there's a real challenge out there. How are we going to make our instruments work for 100 years, and how are we going to deal with all this data? And there are techniques for doing that, uh, something called rainflow analysis that we're using to, to take all that measured data and just capture out of it what is it that we really need to know. One more key story, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop the stories, uh, where I think instrumentation monitoring can play a very beneficial role for us. In the United States, like many other countries, we have a lot of deficient old stuff. And this is a bridge, a mile and a half long bridge, uh, elevated in Springfield, Massachusetts, declared functionally obsolete. Do you know what you do to declare a bridge functionally obsolete in the United States? You go out and do a visual inspection. You have a checklist, and if certain things are checked off and the numbers add up over a certain number, it's functionally obsolete, and it has to go into an inventory to replace it. So we had some wise people who said, boy, that just doesn't sound very nice to, uh, very reasonable to us. So we went out and put sensors on this. Um, I got this slide out of order. We went out and put sensors on this to, at key locations, and it had, it already had developed some fracture cracks in the web indicating fatigue. Uh, but we went and, and with some help of some uh, good structural engineers, instrumented this, we ran heavy loads across it to try to measure uh, how it would respond, put that into a model, calibrate it, and then ran in-service monitoring for a month to collect actual data. All of that allowed them to go into a model then, which uh, the end result of which was to say, this bridge is not being stressed over that low level ambient stress below which you do not get further fatigue. Right? We've got to fix a couple of problems with, uh, with some of the joints, but you do that, and this bridge should continue to last structurally for many more years. So what they decided, the only thing they had to do was replace the deck at 200 million bucks, but the original replacement program was 800 million dollars. That's a hell of a savings for something that was around $200,000 in cost. 
These are other ways, I think, on where we're going to use instrumentation monitoring uh, to help us uh, deal with these aging uh, infrastructure projects. So, a couple of key things. Um, you know, it, you, we have all these tools today to gather data, and uh, what do you do with it? Well, in order to use it as an effective risk management tool, uh, you got to get it in a timely way. It's got to accurately describe what's really going on, so you can't get junk data. Uh, it's got to get to decision makers with something for them to decide on what to do. And when you decide to do something, you got to do it, and you got to do it quickly. And so these are some key points uh, that have to be a part of a, a uh, instrumentation monitoring program. It's not just putting in instruments. And there are other key point I want to make is, is not really written very clearly anywhere, but it's the importance of separating out what I call evaluation from interpretation. And for an effective instrumentation monitoring program to work, you've got to really do this very carefully. Evaluation, I think, means do the data we have make sense? Are they good? Are they sound? Are they intact? And that really is a question for your instrumentation team and gurus to sort through. And they should be doing that as a part of the data gathering and, and, and before they pass it on to the engineers, those who are going to interpret and say, what does this mean? They got to make sure that data is good and solid to the best of their ability. That's called evaluation. Then you pass it on and the people who do the design and interpret this then say, they don't ask the question, are these data any good? They ask the question, what do these data mean and what do we, we do? You really have to separate those things. Otherwise, you get caught wrapped around an axle of, oh, do these data make sense? Are these data any good, I mean? You don't want to go there. So today we're working on ways, how do we do all this better and faster? How do we deal with all this data? And this is just a pictorial, how those here at the center, I just heard a very nice presentation in China, uh, how you take all these different sources of data and integrate them into something that then is going to feed us on our end, on our devices, reliable data, timely, with ways that we can make good decisions. So this is where a lot of the action is going today. And, and part of that is that you've got to, as a part of that decision-making process, you've got to be able to set up your action levels. And we use a simple green, yellow, red that's becoming almost universal across the world. And not only do you do that, but you have a way of reporting this stuff out quickly, efficiently. We do it daily. And along with it is what is the response plan? Just put right up there so people don't have to delay in trying to figure out how they respond when the data go yellow and red. And you feed all this out on devices and uh, just amazing what we can do. In order for that to work though, you've got to have an effective performance monitoring plan. I mentioned that word earlier, I had underlined it, and that means it's got to have all the components in this slide. You know, let's take a quick scan of that. It's, you, if you miss any of this, your program's success is threatened. And there's one on here, a systematic approach. I want to give credit to our friend John Dunnicliffe, who's a fellow Englishman for many of you, uh, who was like the father of geotechnical engineering, lives here in England now. Anybody know John or seen him lately? You know, John and I, John started with a systematic approach. I helped him simplify it a little bit. In fact, I think I'm the only American author of a chapter in the uh, ICE geotechnical engineering book, because John and I wrote something on the instrumentation monitoring. I just want to say something about the importance of visual observations. Here's a job where we have a lot of instruments on these tracks, right? They didn't tell us anything. It just happened that our technician who was servicing the instruments walked along one day and saw this big void underneath these tracks, right? So you have all the instruments in the world. It's still important to have that visual observation of a mind that knows what to look for and uh, include that in your program. Um, so my key points in wrapping up is uh, you know, a performance monitoring program is a very effective way to help us control, manage risk on a project. Um, you know, it, it's got to consist of visual surveillance and monitoring with instrumentation. It's, it's got to be designed to be executed in a systematic way. And one of the things John would tell you is every instrument must have a purpose. It must be designed to answer a question. That's a very important statement I just made that I don't have time to elaborate on. It must provide reliable results when and where needed. 
Um, and you've got to have an action plan. I can give you the data, but if you're not prepared to do something about it, it's worthless. So just stay at home and don't bother with spending all that money. Uh, you don't wait until you get in the red zone to talk about what do we do. Um, wrapping up, uh, instrumentation monitoring response uh, program can be a key part of risk management. Uh, it can, as I showed you earlier, I think we can order, lower risk by one to two orders of magnitude. To be successful, it's got to have a strong champion who's going to stay behind it and push it, promote it, and talk about the purpose, why it's so important when people come to attack it. Because it's one of the first things to get axed out of a budget, or at least for people to try to ax out of a budget. It's got to detect unexpected performance and time for us to do something to either change the risk, or to change the risk, either the probability or the impact. Um, and there are new technologies that make all this very practical, effective, not that costly. Uh, but for them to really work, you've got to evaluate and interpret the data uh, quickly. And then you've got to take action uh, when it's needed. So that's a lot thrown at you. I talked a little fast, but I had a lot to say. So I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I hope it was worthwhile. Uh, those of you who might want to delve into this a little further, send me an email. I'll be happy to send you a copy of the slides and a couple of references where I've written about some of this stuff.